Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Having discussed diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lung in the previous two lectures, it is the right time for us to learn about mechanisms of diffusion impairment, the phenomenon which appears as the D in our mnemonic. Diffusion of oxygen occurs from the alveolus to the capillary and carbon dioxide in the reverse direction. The mechanisms of diffusion impairment involve reduction in surface area, increase in thickness of the respiratory membrane and another phenomenon called VQ mismatch which we will discuss in the next lecture. VQ mismatch can be equated to diffusion impairment or reduction in surface area in fact. In diffusion impairment we have seen that oxygen flux is reduced and partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood will be lower, what we call arterial hypoxia. However, carbon dioxide flux can be normal and arterial concentration of carbon dioxide or PaCO2 will be normal or in fact low in diffusion impairment. This is the big lesson in respiratory physiology. In diffusion impairment due to reduction in surface area of the respiratory membrane, increase in thickness or in VQ mismatch, oxygen uptake can be reduced, PaO2 can be low, carbon dioxide elimination need not be affected and PaCO2 can be normal or even lower. This picture is what we describe as type 1 respiratory failure. Will there be respiratory acidosis? No, because carbon dioxide is normal, there is no respiratory acidosis in diffusion impairment. Let us now look at mechanisms of diffusion impairment and some disease names. The conditions where there can be a reduction in surface area, the easiest to understand is lung resection where due to some reason one lung has been removed. Either one whole lung is removed or a section of the lung is removed due to for example a tumour. When a portion of the lung is resected then the surface area available for gas exchange would be less than normal resulting in diffusion impairment. Another important example of a condition where surface area is reduced is emphysema where there is destruction of the alveolar walls. We will see a cartoon in the next slide. What are conditions where they, there is an increase in thickness of the respiratory membrane? Interstitial fibrosis where the interstitium between the alveolar epithelium on one side and the capillary endothelium on the other side, what we call the pulmonary interstitium is thickened. It could be due to fibrosis and if the fibrosis is not due to any known cause, we call it idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and a set of conditions called pneumoconiosis where we know that the fibrosis is due to some dust particle. For example, in asbestosis, asbestos fiber when inhaled initiates the fibrosis. In silicosis, silica dust as would happen in construction workers initiates the fibrosis in the lung. So, these are all examples of conditions in which the pulmonary interstitium is thickened and therefore the distance through which gases have to diffuse increases. We have already seen that even if the interstitium is thickened, oxygen diffusion would be affected but not carbon dioxide diffusion. Pulmonary edema is an example of an acute condition where gases have to diffuse through a layer of fluid to reach the other side. VQ mismatch or ventilation perfusion mismatch is another condition which I would like to club along with reduction in surface area of the respiratory membrane. We will discuss in detail later. So, what is emphysema? What happens in emphysema? In emphysema, 
the interalveolar walls are destroyed. For example, this region, this interalveolar wall is destroyed by an enzyme called elastase which is secreted by neutrophils. Neutrophils coming into the lung due to an inflammatory process and releasing neutrophil elastase causes destruction of the alveolar walls. So, when alveolar walls are destroyed, the as spaces are larger than normal. The other phenomenon you notice in emphysema is that the bronchioles are narrower than usual, the lumen is narrower, we will see why later on. The pathology in emphysema is not only reduction in surface area of gas exchange because interalveolar walls have been destroyed, so there is a diffusion impairment, there is an additional pathology due to narrowing of the bronchi. So, air flow through the airways is reduced resulting in ventilation impairment as well. This is therefore classified as an obstructive disorder where there is obstruction to the airways. This is how we can portray interstitial fibrosis where there is thickening of the alveolar walls. Here, Initially, there is diffusion impairment because gases have to diffuse through a thicker membrane, but eventually the compliance of the lung may be reduced so much that even expansion of the lungs during inspiration becomes problematic because compliance is low and therefore, this would be classified as a restrictive disease which restricts lung expansion. When we hear of these terms emphysema and fibrosis, the other chronic disease that we should know is chronic bronchitis. Here again, the lumen of the bronchioles and the smaller bronchi is narrowed due to inflammation and excess mucus secretion. There is obstruction to airflow through the airways in this condition and therefore, this also is classified as an obstructive disease. Emphysema and chronic bronchitis are together known as chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. There is no infective pathology here. Both of them can occur in smoking or in exposure to environmental particulate dust, traffic policemen and women using wood stoves can develop chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases just as cigarette smokers would do. In obstructive pulmonary diseases, the problem is in the airways and there is obstruction to air flow and therefore, ventilation may be affected. In restrictive diseases, there is restriction to expansion of the lung because compliance is low and eventually ventilation impairment can occur in this condition as well. But right now, our focus being diffusion impairment. Diffusion impairment occurs in emphysema due to loss of surface area and it occurs in interstitial fibrosis due to increase in thickness of the respiratory membrane. So, you could fill this table to, to differentiate between the pathologies and the manifestations of these diseases. In, in emphysema, the surface area is lower. In interstitial fibrosis, the respiratory membrane is thicker and in both conditions, there is diffusion impairment which will affect arterial oxygen concentration, not carbon dioxide concentration. Lung compliance will be lower in interstitial fibrosis, whereas in emphysema, it can actually be higher because you have destroyed some of the alveolar walls and therefore, there is less resistance to expansion. Airway resistance is higher in emphysema, we will see why later, there is narrowing of bronchioles there. The other condition that leads to reduction in ventilation, obstructive diseases will reduce ventilation because it is difficult for air to move in and out through a, a narrower lumen. In chronic bronchitis again, there is narrowing of the lumen and ventilation is affected. So, there is no diffusion impairment in chronic bronchitis directly, but eventually we will see that there can be areas of VQ mismatch even in chronic bronchitis 
which therefore will lead to diffusion impairment. But otherwise, if you want it uh, black and white, at least initially, we can say that chronic bronchitis causes ventilation impairment. It is easier to understand that because of narrowing of the lumina, but not necessarily any diffusion impairment, at least earlier on. It must be remembered that emphysema and chronic bronchitis can both occur in cigarette smoking and in those other conditions where people are exposed to smoke and particulate dust. They are in fact at two ends of the same spectrum. When you go into clinical years, you would uh, hear about something called pink puffers, a term attributed to emphysematous patients and blue bloaters, a term attributed to chronic bronchitis patients. If these are chronic conditions, let us look at some acute conditions where there can be diffusion impairment, say pleural effusion, tuberculous pleural effusion or pleural effusion due to any cause. If there is fluid in the pleural space, then the alveoli in that area would have collapsed because we will learn later that a negative intrapleural pressure is important to keep the alveoli expanded. If the pleural space is filled with fluid or even air as a pneumothorax, alveoli would collapse. When the alveoli collapse, there is reduction in surface area available for exchange of gases and that will amount to diffusion impairment. Pulmonary edema is a condition where there is fluid within the alveoli, what is called alveolar edema and if the fluid collects in the interstitial spaces, you would call it interstitial edema if the fluid is here. If the fluid is inside, we call it alveolar edema in non-infectious cases like left heart failure. But if the fluid is due to inflammation of the alveoli due to bacterial infection or viral infection, we will call it pneumonia. Mnemonic consolidation is a term which is used to describe fluid in the alveoli due to a bacterial infection. We speak about bacterial pneumonia, viral pneumonia, etc. In these conditions, the fluid would have increased the distance through which gases have to travel to reach the other side. So, it amounts to thickening of the respiratory membrane. So, you could do a similar table for these conditions to understand what happens to each of these and is there a diffusion impairment or a ventilation impairment? What about perfusion? These are questions you can answer for yourselves. In summary, diffusion impairment can occur due to loss of surface area of the respiratory membrane in these conditions, increase in thickness of the respiratory membrane as in these conditions or a phenomenon called ventilation perfusion mismatch which we will discuss later. And we should remember diffusion impairment causes type 1 respiratory failure where arterial oxygen concentration can be lower, hypoxia can occur, but arterial carbon dioxide concentration can be normal. There is no hypercarbia. Thank you for your attention.